The preservation of the Developmental Biology film series was made possible by generous contributions from Distinguished University Professor of Geosciences, Lynn Margulis Terence Malick Chelsea Green Publishing The Politics and Practice of Sustainable Living The Hardy Lane Foundation The International Symbiosis Society Geobook Studio Publisher of The Biggest Picture Hummingbird Films Producer of the documentary Symbiotic Earth and supporters of the Lynn Margulis Archive at ScholarWorks. The water mold Blastocladiella emersonii occurs in soils and freshwater ponds and streams. It is a useful organism for studying growth and differentiation. The plant consists of a terminal sporangium and a basal cell which bears rhizoids. Here the fungus is releasing motile zoospores from a sporangium. These are asexual reproductive cells, and they are the plant's only apparent mode of reproduction. The zoospores disseminate the fungus in nature. The zoospore measures about 7 by 9 microns. The nucleus is separated by a double membrane from a nuclear cap in which are stored almost all the ribosomes in the cell. Its cytoplasm contains conspicuous organelles called gamma particles. These appear to contain DNA. The flagellum terminates in a kinetosome. Most internal details are difficult to see in the living spore. The nuclear cap appears large and crescent-shaped. Since the spore does not have a rigid wall, it can become amoeboid. Eventually, a zoospore retracts its flagellum and insists. During withdrawal of the flagellum, the nucleus and its nuclear cap rotate as a unit within the cell. The flagellum is withdrawn through a stationary point on the spore surface. Follow the movement of the white globules, which serve as convenient markers for the internal rotation. By the time the flagellum is fully retracted, the cyst wall has begun to form around the plasma membrane. An encysted spore can be made to develop along any one of several alternate paths. Three of them are shown here. One of them gives rise to an ordinary colorless plant and culminates in the formation of a thin-walled sporangium which releases many spores. Another gives rise to a very tiny plant which produces but a single zoospore. A third one gives rise to a plant which forms a thick-walled resistant sporangium capable of surviving under adverse conditions. On most media, a spore will develop into an ordinary colorless plant. After spore germination, developing rhizoids anchor the single-celled plant to its substratum. For about a day, the cell will grow exponentially. 
The original spore nucleus will reproduce to yield many additional nuclei embedded in a common cytoplasm. When growth stops, the cell differentiates a multinucleate sporangium in which each nucleus will be incorporated into a zoospore. One or more discharged papillae will be produced. Their tips dissolve, forming exit pores through which the zoospores escape. Let us look once more at the production and discharge of spores, starting with a full-grown plant. There is a sharp change in texture of the protoplasm as it is partitioned into zoospores. Zoospore formation takes about 10 minutes. If a germinating spore is partially deprived of nutrients shortly after encystment, it stops growing. The plantlet then functions as a very small sporangium and produces but a single zoospore. Here are some of these small plantlets which are barely larger than a spore. Note the abnormally tiny papilla through which the much larger zoospore must squeeze to escape. When sodium bicarbonate is added to the medium, encysted spores develop into plants bearing resistance sporangia. Such plants grow only about one-fifth as fast as ordinary colorless plants. A cross wall will develop and divide the plant into two cells. Protoplasm moves upward and a nearly empty basal cell partially collapses. The upper cell is now a multinucleate sporangium. It forms a thick, brown, pitted wall, and it shrinks as it matures. But no spores are formed within this sporangium. Resistant sporangial plants are also formed in colonies which arise from ordinary colorless plants. When such plants release spores on an auger surface, they cannot swim away. Instead, they settle down around the parent plant, insist, and develop into second generation plantlets. These plants in turn produce third, fourth, and fifth generation plants, many of which eventually form resistant sporangia, possibly due to high carbon dioxide levels which result from crowded conditions. These resistant sporangia vary in size and color. The colony reaches this stage in about five days and then ceases to enlarge. In nature, the dormant resistant sporangium enables blastocladiella to endure adverse conditions. Once a resistant sporangium has formed, it remains dormant and does not produce spores. But a resistant sporangium can be induced to make and then release zoospores if it is put in water. The outer thick wall cracks open and an inner membrane extends through the opening to form a papilla. This dissolves as in an ordinary colorless plant. An exit pore is formed and the spores are released. Here a resistant sporangium has been placed in water. A papilla is emerging through a crack in the wall. Darkening of the cell will signal cleavage into spores. You have now seen various aspects of cell differentiation unfold along three asexual developmental pathways, all starting with a single zoospore. One gives rise to an evanescent 
ordinary colorless plant which reproduces by forming numerous zoospores. Another, induced by starvation, gives rise to a tiny thin-walled plantlet which reproduces by way of a single zoospore. A third one, induced either by crowded conditions or sodium bicarbonate, forms thick-walled resistant sporangia which do not automatically produce spores, but which are caused to do so by a change in their environment. Whichever route is taken, the resulting zoospores can again take any of the three developmental pathways. The water mold Blastocladiella emersonii is one of several primitive organisms being used by biologists in their search for solutions to developmental problems.